The Battle of the Kalka River was one of the most famous victories of great Mongol general Subodai Batar. Here, we will clear some of the fog of myth which has settled around this epic engagement between Mongols, Rus, and Kuman Kipchaks. After the pursuit of Khorizm Shah Muhammad, Mongol generals Zevnoyan and Subodai fought through the Caucasus and upon their exit were confronted by an army of Kuman Kipchaks and Alans. Bribery led the Kuman Kipchaks to abandon the Alans, and the Mongols crushed each independently. In this engagement, the two most powerful Kuman Hans of the steppe, Yuri Kanchakovich and Daniel Kobjakovich, were killed, and the survivors fled under the new ranking Kuman chief, Hotian Khan. There was considerable intermarriage between Kuman Kipchak leadership and the Rus princes for military and political alliance. Hotian Khan was father-in-law to the powerful Prince Mstislav of Galicia, known as the Bold. Energetic and, as his name suggests, quite daring, Mstislav was moved by the warnings of his father-in-law. Khotian argued that the Mongols would pursue the Kuman Kipchak survivors, and once they defeated them, the Rus would be next. 13th century Russia was not a unified entity, but a collection of often competing principalities, the most prominent being Veliki Novgorod, Vladimir and Kiev. Mstislav the Bold and Hotian organized a meeting of Rus princes and spurred them into action. By all accounts, this was a massive force, up to 80,000 men, though only a small portion were experienced soldiers. The Druzhina cavalry of the nobles and the Kuman Kipchak horse archers. The three leading Rus princes of this coalition were all named Mstislav. The aforementioned Mstislav the Bull of Galicia, Mstislav of Chernigov, and Mstislav Romanovich, the Grand Prince of Kiev. Notably absent were the two most powerful principalities, that of Novgorod and Vladimir Zuzdal. Dev and Subodai were hardly idle while this Russian force gathered. After their initial victory over the Kuman Kipchaks, the Mongols followed them west. In winter 1222, Mongol forces enter Crimea and there sacked Soldea, worth a minor digression. A popular retelling has the local Venetian traders entering into an alliance with the Mongols here, sharing information on Europe to them and spreading Mongol propaganda in exchange for exclusive trade rights with the Mongols. Subodai then going on to sack the rival Italian Genoese outpost of Soldea. Such statements are repeated online and in popular literature, but have no basis in historical fact, the origins of which historian Peter Jackson traces to a French work from the 1890s, which, as he says, has all the authority of a historical novel. While Venice now had economic ties with Crimea, and a few Venetians likely stationed there, Soldea itself was an outpost of the Empire of Trebizond, another Byzantine successor state. But as argued by historian Andrew Peacock, when the Mongols arrived at Soldea in 1222, it may have been under the brief control of the Seljuks of Rum, taken as a part of their war against Trebizond. The belief in a Venetian-Mongol alliance from this episode seems to be in part a conflation of later Italian and especially Venetian prominence in both the Crimea and among the Mongols in the later half of the 13th century. The Mongol sack of Soldea had nothing to do with internal Venetian politics and commerce. After this foray into Crimea, Dev and Subodai were aware of the Rus Kuman force making its way down the Dnieper River. Envoys were sent, hoping to pry apart the Rus and the Kuman Kipchaks as they had done between the Kipchaks and the Alans. Wary now of Mongol tricks, the envoys were executed. Another group of envoys were sent, informing the Rus that they had just declared war. Those envoys were allowed to return. As the coalition made its way downriver, on the east side of the Dnieper, an advanced party of Mongols were spotted. One of the Mstislavs, likely Mstislav the Bold in association with the Kipchak, quickly forded the river and fell upon the Mongols. Not expecting such a sudden attack, the Mongols retreated to a Kipchak Kurgan and buried their leader, Himyabek, within it, hoping to return for him. The Kipchak urged Mstislav against pursuing the Mongols, saying instead that they must find the captain, a person of some importance. Soon they uncovered 
and executed him. The Chronicle of Novgorod provides this episode in surprising detail. Clearly, it stood out to the Rus who witnessed and recorded it. This seemingly minor engagement has often been overlooked in retellings, presented at most as intended to lure the Rus into a feigned retreat. But in a recent article, historian Stephen Powell argues that this actually records the death of Zev Noyan. Zev's fate, like so many top Mongols, is not recorded in our sources from within the Empire. In most, like the Secret History of the Mongols or Juvenis, History of the World Conqueror, Zev simply disappears after 1223. It is also notable that the Imperial sources provide little to no detail on the entire campaign. Pau argues that Timyavek was how a Russian may have interpreted the Turkic form of Zev's name. The Kuman Kipchaks, Turkic speakers, having already fought Zev, would have been keen to avenge their fallen comrades, explaining their insistence to uncover him at the Kurgan. The Rus chroniclers understood that it was an important figure they had uncovered, but didn't know just how important he was, even when the Kiptrak told them his name. This explains in part the absence of his fate in our pro-Mongolian sources. To put simply, it was an embarrassing end for such a prominent general, especially for one whose descendants continued to hold top positions within the Empire. Authors like Juveni, if they even did know, likely considered it better to say nothing. Zev had never been one to stray from danger, leading from the fore his entire career, and may have gone in person to scout out the enemy, not expecting he'd be too close to escape. With this in mind, it spins what followed. Mstislav the Bold, enthused by this minor victory, forced the army to pursue the fleeing Mongols east for eight or nine days. While generally portrayed as a well-orchestrated, feigned retreat planned out by Subade, Pau suggests this was an actual retreat, demoralized by the loss of Zev. The sources suggest Zev had been in command over Subade, who had had little for independent command by this point. Suddenly forced into leadership at 20,000 Mongols, many hundreds of kilometers away from any support, Subade may have had no choice but to flee until an option presented itself, all the while loot, herds, and slaves falling behind into enemy hands. As the week went on, Subade would have noted the coalition behind them was now being strung out. The faster Kuban Kipchaks in the front, perhaps alongside Galician cavalry of Mstislav the Bold, followed by the remainder of the cavalry, then the infantry, and behind them, the baggage train. Instead of 20,000 Mongols against 80,000, Subade could now bring the full weight of his army against only sections of the enemy. By the 31st of May, 1223, Subade reached the Kalka River. The Kipchak Galicians were not far behind. The heavily armored Galician cavalry was met with arrows, the Kuman light horsemen met with heavy cavalry, and both retreated before the sudden onslaught. The Kipchaks and Galicians fled directly into the oncoming Rus troops. The advance stalled, formations broke and confusion now reigned, and Subade unleashed his horsemen. The fighting was fierce, but the Rus were shattered. Most of the army ran, but in the open steppe there was nowhere to hide from the horsemen of the Great Khan. In this rout, tens of thousands fell, many princes among them, including Mstislav of Chernigov and his son. Those who reached the Dnieper found no luck. Mstislav the Bold, living up to his name, was among the first to flee. And when he reached the Dnieper, took one of the boats the army had used across, and cut the rest loose to prevent the Mongols, and anyone else, from following. While the rest fled, Mstislav of Kiev withdrew to a nearby hill and formed a stockade out of wagons. For a few days they held out. Mongol arrows reigning among them until Subade sent an envoy to negotiate, promising not to spill the blood of the princes. Mstislav and the princes agreed and were betrayed. Their army killed, the princes were placed in bonds under boards on which the Mongols feasted, slowly crushing them. According to the Chronicle of Novgorod, one in ten men returned from this expedition. It was recorded that in their flight, the Kumans killed some of the fleeing Rus for their supplies, having lost their own baggage. 
In time, Hotian and the Kuman survivors went to the Kingdom of Hungary, seeking asylum there until the Mongols returned for him in the 1240s. The horrific slaughter of Kalka was, however, meaningless. A brief probe as far as Novgorod Zaversky was undertaken, but the Mongols did not tarry. It was still a long march back to Mongolia, and the death of Zev took the luster off the expedition. For the Rus principalities, they learned nothing of this enemy, and quickly returned to fighting amongst each other. It seems the event, if not forgotten, was ignored and not understood, as no precautions were taken for their potential return. The sources implying the Rus saw it as a one-time tragedy. The Mongols, however, remembered every detail. The Rus and Kumin Kiptrak gave good resistance, and Subade would need a much stronger force should he return. I do not think this harms Subade's image as a great general, for if Pao's theory is true, Subade stole victory from the jaws of defeat. Few generals could have kept their head thrust under such circumstances, alone and outnumbered, yet Subade turned it into one of his greatest victories. But Subade's road east would not be peaceful. Along the Volga River, his army suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Volga Bulgars. In the next video, we will examine this great black mark on Subade's career, and why the defeat of a man considered undefeatable by posterity has been forgotten. Thank you.